Okay, now I'd like to introduce to uh, Mark Shuttleworth. Um, yeah, everybody knows about Ubuntu and everything, so I think there's a good chance to discuss a lot of things now. Mark, it's, it's Thank yours. You. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, guys. It's, uh, it's great to be here uh, again. Um, Brazil last year was fantastic. I think this year has been uh, even better. And uh, I'm looking forward to many, many more DebConfs. I thought what I'd speak about uh, briefly this morning is a little bit of my own background and story, because I, I hope that that will put Ubuntu into context for you guys. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about my, my dream for Ubuntu, what I, what I am doing it for, why I'm doing it. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about the team that we've brought together, how we, how we go about creating the team, uh, the processes that we follow, the, the community structure, um, the way we work, uh, how at a code level we kind of weave uh, in and out of the, 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 the Debian world and why I think that's a really healthy and good thing. Uh, potentially the relationships that we have with, with other people who live in, uh, in, in the Debian universe. Uh, then the, I know that there are guys with tons of questions. So the most important thing maybe that we can do in this session is to answer as many of those questions as possible. Um, if you guys are on hash DebConf and fire questions away as well, then um, will someone make a note of those questions? Okay, Mako will grab questions like that so that we can, we can kind of rapid fire work through any questions that you want to submit by IRC in person or anonymously. And then obviously if you have anything, any question about anything that I'm saying, please just uh, stick a hand up. Uh, Mark, can yeah. I just briefly interrupt you? Uh, if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand so I can get the microphone up to you. Thanks. Okay. Um, right, so my free software story starts back in 1994, 1995, the early days of the web at the University of Cape Town. And uh, I discovered Slackware Linux and then very quickly moved on to, to, to Debian and also discovered Python. And those two have really been, uh, Debian and Python have really been the, 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 the free software platform that you know, has empowered everything that I've done. Uh, we use that combination at my foundation, we used it at Thought, we've used it everywhere. Uh, in those early days, most of the hacking that I did was in C and Python. Mostly the C stuff that I was doing was maintaining Python interfaces to various uh, modules. I was maintainer of the MSQL, which is kind of a before MySQL came along, um, uh, SQL database uh, and other Python modules. Um, I got really drawn into the crypto world. Crypto was going through a fascinating time because the US was treating um, crypto as a t like tanks and uh, RPG guns. In those days, if you were a, a German bank and you wanted to set up a secure web server, you had to fill out the same set of forms uh, to the American Bureau of Export Administration as if you wanted to buy a tank and, uh, and ship it over to Germany. Um, so there were all sorts of opportunities for crazy young South African kids in the free software world. Uh, I did quite a bit of hacking on uh, OpenSSL, which was then called SSL EAY, um, uh, and got drawn effectively into that crypto game. Uh, the whole dot-com thing, uh, you know, when the, when the musical chairs game stopped, I was very, very lucky and then found myself suddenly out of a job but with the potential to do, you know, almost anything, uh, which is quite a daunting thing because you really defined yourself according to, you know, one thing. It's, uh, it's crypto and Python uh, and then suddenly, you, you know, that's gone and you have to go figure out what else you want to do. So I asked myself, you know, what is the one thing that I want to do before I die? And the answer came back, fly in space. Uh, and I, it, for like a day or two, I really wished it hadn't because I suddenly thought, oh, shit, if I don't go and try, I'm going to feel like a coward for the rest of my life um, because it was kind of scary to go. Uh, so I went to Russia and, and spent a year and a bit working on that project. Um, along the way, after thought, I set up um, something called the Shuttleworth Foundation in South Africa. And that focuses on innovation and education. So trying to find ways to transform the education system um, so that we can actually realistically hope to deliver education in a developing country to uh, millions and millions of kids of very, very low resources. As part of that foundation, uh, we fund tons of open source uh, work. There's a project called Tux Labs, uh, where we funded, I think it's up to 200 schools now with complete uh, open source K-12 LTSP-based uh, um, uh, computer laboratories. Uh, the Freedom Toaster, I don't know if any of you guys have heard of the Fre Freedom Toaster, that's a project of the Shuttleworth Foundation. Uh, we pulled off the, the biggest uh, LPI certification day in history 
in South Africa when I think about 160 guys uh, came in and wrote the LPI exams. Uh, one guy who's totally self-trained wrote, uh, from the townships, wrote all the LPI exams in one day, um, just, I think, to prove he could. Uh, learning Linux, those, those uh, uh, free content licensed, uh, complete set of Linux training materials, that's all, that's all the work of the foundation. Um, and we also worked with the ICDL guys. We were the first guys to convince them to, to make, under a free license, available the, uh, the training materials for the ICDL. Um, other stuff that we have done that's quite fun as well, there was a, uh, a case in South Africa, a court case against some students who were making T-shirts with uh, uh, f funny rip-offs of corporate trademarks. And they'd been sued by the South African breweries, which is sort of the most important company in South Africa. Um, and uh, and they'd, got, they'd lost all the way up to the Constitutional Court, and they'd run out of money. So we went in and funded them, and uh, they won. They got a unanimous constitutional verdict that humor is more important than trademarks. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Some of the stuff that I'm really interested in that we're doing now over there is, again, all got to do with applying the principles of open source to education. So collaborative content creation, getting teachers using MediaWiki to create textbooks effectively for, for one another. Um, we're also finding stuff that's more related to, uh, to Ubuntu itself. For example, in, in the translation space, those of you who've heard of translate.org and Poodle, a web-based uh, translation thing, which is open source, um, I was the initial funder for all of that work, um, which is not Rosetta, the project that we are, are working on inside uh, Ubuntu. A school tool and school bell. Um, school tool is kind of school administration. I think it's very important that we have an absolutely free GPL, platform like an SAP for schools so that they can run themselves. And the reason I think that's important is when you go into developing worlds, it's not the amount of money you give a school that matters, it's how well organized they are that matters. So that work's being done. And as part of that, we've produced School Bell, which I think is the first open source, uh, you know, complete open source from the ground up um, calendar server. Brian would be able to tell us more. He's the release manager of, of that. Um, I also run a global bounty program, uh, which started around with Mozilla and uh, trying to uh, accelerate the development of Mozilla, and now also covers GNOME and a couple of other areas. And in partnership with the South African government and HP, fund something called Go Open Source, which was like a, 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 a basically a, a, a marketing campaign for the concept of open source, which was the first time that had been done in the world. And uh, we produced a TV show which I think is available under, under an open content license. It's being distributed in Africa um, freely. Uh, and it was very cool. We got interviews on that from sort of all of the big guns talking to you know, people in South Africa about open source. Um, so that's kind of the background of, of the work that I have been doing in, in, in open source. Um, about two years ago, I became very frustrated with the state of the distributions market. You know, since 1995, I've, I've kind of had an idea of what I think is important, what open source can deliver for everyday users. And I've been waiting for somebody to do it. You know, I've been waiting for Red Hat to do it. I've been waiting for Novell or Suze or someone to step up and actually deliver for the world what open source can deliver. And it was getting increasingly frustrating to see that nobody was actually doing that. If you did the analysis of, you know, replacing you know, every, every computer in, in South African breweries, you know, taking all the windows out and replacing it with Red Hat, uh, socially and financially, it, it wouldn't look really that different. Uh, and that just seems to me, you know, a, a travesty of justice. You know, open source and free software uh, are capable of delivering far more. Uh, and so I fig you know, figured, what the hell, why not um, climb in and see if we can build that model and see if we can make it work. Uh, there were a couple of other things going on at the time that uh, I thought would make it a really interesting time to start doing that. And the first of those is something called distributed revision control. Uh, and distributed revision control um, uh, is, is suddenly coming to the forefront now, but it's something we've been working on for the last year and a half. Uh, many of you from both will have heard of BitKeeper. Um, BitKeeper is a commercial distributed revision control system that the kernel guys used for about two and a half years until the whole situation imploded as all, the, all of us free software nuts, nuts predicted it would. Um, but what, the, what BitKeeper did for the kernel was dramatically accelerate the ability of 
ordinary people and other people to participate in kernel development because suddenly you didn't have as much of a bottleneck at the center effectively. You could create branches and you could collaborate, you could create ad hoc groups to collaborate around features and then sort of land those features into A.J. Morton or, or uh, 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 M.M.'s, Andrew Morton's branches and move those over to, 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 to other people's branches and ultimately bring them into Linus's tree. Distributed revision control effectively lets us keep track of different patches all over the world, whether they're in or whether they're out of any given particular tree. And it seemed to me that this was, this was going to be one of the key platforms for, again, accelerating uh, open source development. So I started funding something called BAS. Uh, we, st we started with sort of a two opposite ends of the spectrum. We started with TLA on the one end, which was distributed, but had all sorts of dash, 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 dash usability <laughs> issues. Um, and we started with a kind of from scratch clean reference implementation that's being done by Martin Poole. Some of you may know him as a contributor to Samba and Kernel and, and others. He uh, um, works with Tridge and other folks like that. Um, so Martin's doing a kind of from scratch Baz NG in Python. And the, uh, the Baz team are, are working from TLA to try and converge on what I hope will be uh, a phenomenal revision control tool. Both of those are under the uh, GPL and, and absolutely freely available. Uh, and I really hope that those are going to replace BitKeeper as, and bring the, the, the social power effectively of distributed uh, revision control, not just to the kernel, but to the whole, the whole open source world. Um, so I really hope that, that Baz is going to bring to the whole of the upstream world what BitKeeper did uh, uh, for the kernel. Why I think that's really important for what we're doing is that it speaks to the heart of branching and forking. One of the, one of the really difficult things in a CVS style world is to have uh, different groups working on different features. In a distributed revision control world, that's exactly how you work. You get teams of people to work and collaborate on a feature on a branch and then merge that in. And you can have you know, multiple branches with people cherry picking effectively. I want to have that feature, that feature, and that feature, and everything else that, that's in main line. Uh, and so you can, you, can, you can stabilize, you can test new ideas, stabilize those ide ideas, and then move them into, uh, into the main line effectively. It seems to me that there's a huge amount of work that happens in the open source world uh, that falls on the floor, right? Every distro, Debian, Red Hat, uh, SUSE, um, Gen2, every distro does valuable work. The maintainers do valuable work, uh, and that work never makes it upstream. And that's a tremendous uh, friction in the open source world. And one of the ways I hope we can eliminate that friction is through the use of distributed revision control, because every patch will be connected to its upstream, which means that you can move code from Gen2 into Red Hat, into Ubuntu, into upstream, and always know which patch is where. So that was, you know, it was, it was, as I started to study this, it was kind of the, the emergence of distributed revision control at that time that I thought would, would really underpin everything that we're doing. So what are Ubuntu and Edge Ubuntu and Kubuntu all about? Um, fundamentally, they're an attempt to deliver to the desktop user the promise of free software. And in the free software world, we're, we're often very quick to say, you know, it's free as in speech, not free as in beer. Don't expect it to be free. You know, there are all these other charges. We, we've almost become allergic to the idea of the free word because um, uh, people li in the early days limited it to kind of free as in beer. But you know what? That free as in beer thing is also really important. You have to have, I believe, you absolutely have to have both. Uh, desktop software should be both free software in the software Libre sense and free software in the sense that you don't have to pay anything for it. Uh, and so we've set ourselves the challenge of providing a fully supported for you know, a reasonable length of time set of releases of the free software world uh, for which nobody has to pay anything. Uh, and the absolute commitment is that will always remain the case. One of the questions that sort of people have been uh, uh, bouncing off me over this week has been, you know, will there be a, a Red Hat Enterprise version of, uh, of Ubuntu? Will there be some sort of corporate enterprise version which you have to subscribe to? Absolutely not. I will, uh, you know, uh, pack up shop before, before taking that step. Uh, there's, there's, I have no desire to join an industry, a software licensing industry, which I effectively think is dying. Um, uh, to me, it's all about trying to figure out how to make this work and keeping it free. Um, so deliver on the promise of open source for, for the end user. 
Um, we, in order to deliver that, uh, one of the first sort of things that I, that I considered as I was going through this was to work within Debian. I considered running for, for DPL, but I decided you know, they were both far better candidates for that and, um, and potentially better ways for me to a achieve goals uh, that I was setting out to do. Uh, and one of the key problems I had with that idea was that in order to optimize for a particular narrow use case, we have to make a bunch of trade-offs which would be wrong to impose on Debian. So, for example, in order to, to hit our release goals, we, we shrink the set of packages that we absolutely care about, and we shrink the number of architectures. And both things, I think, would are compromises to the core values of Debian, right? Debian being the universal operating system. Uh, there is an enormous benefit to the open source community in the fact that across all of these architectures, you know, all of these packages get compiled. Upstream guys will tell you they only get you know, in, in many cases, they only get porting patches from this community. So it seemed to me wrong to come into this community and argue passionately to, to get rid of that. Combine that with distributed revision control, and it seems to me that the, the best way to do this is, is to um, build a community that's focused on a subset of the goals in order to drive that agenda forward, but to do it in such a way that the broader family, the broader community, can actually uh, benefit from that work where it's appropriate. So... The, the, the kind of goal we set ourselves was to work um, to a narrow set of objectives, but with a completely open agenda. There's no Ubuntu private, right? Like there's a Debian private mailing list. There's no Ubuntu private. Everything we do happens on IRC and on public mailing lists. There is, um, uh, there's no behind-the-scenes setting of agenda, uh, agendas. We, we don't take a decision. My team would not let me take a decision without putting it through the, the kind of Ubuntu uh, governance process. Uh, I am the self-appointed benevolent dictator for life, um, so I do carry a swing vote. Um, but the, 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 I'm very conscious of the fact that every time I use that swing vote or every time I advocate for something which the, the core team is not that interested in, effectively, it costs me, uh, I call them brownie points, but ultimately it's sustainability points, right? Um, every delta that we have to carry is a financial cost and uh, 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 potentially a social cost. Every, uh, uh, any st anything that we do that does not meet the sort of core values of our core team uh, effectively weakens our community. So I'm very, very conscious of, uh, of those things. Um, what I'm really proud of over the last year is that we have managed, in fact, to, uh, to, to lead the way on a couple of key features. Uh, Zorg was controversial. We decided to do it. Uh, and because we had, uh, we were a smaller subset of architectures and a bunch of other factors, we were able to do it. And I'm really proud of the fact that that work, that excellent work, is now going uh, after a, an appropriate security review and audit uh, into unstable uh, as we speak. Um, on a couple of fairly tricky transitions like GCC4, and Python 2.4, uh, our team has effectively led that work. And so you can go to a, a location uh, which, is well, which is well known, where we publish every day all of the patches of the deltas between ourselves and Debian in a format which is easy for DDs to take and, and, and bring in. Uh, and you can get patches that are going to make the GCC4 transition uh, for Etch a whole lot easier. Um, now, there have been, been some mutterings about binary compatibility. Um, and there, as far as I'm aware, there are two examples of binary incompatibility uh, that have been thrown out. Uh, the first is a binary incompatibility between our Hori release and the Sarge release. And I think it's important to know that right up to the point when Hori released, uh, our libc's were binary compatible between Debian and Ubuntu. And after the Hori release, uh, something came up which uh, was potentially a problem for Debian. And after a discussion between the release managers in Debian, uh, the guys in Ubuntu, the guys in Debian, which involved a clear recognition that this would be breaking compatibility between the two, it was decided to upload to Debian an incompatible version of libc. And I absolutely support the right of the Debian maintainers to do that. I think uh, it's very important that we not put ourselves in the shoebox of, uh, of, 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 of binary compatibility. Imagine if, you know, I wouldn't want to feel responsible for a decision to say do not fix that issue in Debian because it's going to break binary compatibility with an existing Ubuntu release, right? But it was not us that introduced that binary compatibility. The other, of course, is now the GCC4 transition. Because we're moving with GCC4 now, 
uh, our next release will be at the C++ level, ABI incompatible, in incompatible with uh, Debian Unstable at the time. But I'm pretty confident that Etch is going to include GCC4. Doko? Yeah? Um, and, uh, and so you know, effectively what we're doing is all of that C++ ABI transition work uh, in a way that is very easy for DDs to, to maintain. If we could bring up on the slide, I'd like to show you guys the directory where we publish literally for every package in Ubuntu and Debian uh, patches of the deltas so that it's possible for you guys to see how, you know, just how easy it is. The, 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 the goal of this was to say, okay, we're going to forge ahead in particular directions, and we're going to do it in such a way that makes it trivially easy for DDs to take the work that they're interested in having. And I think we've absolutely delivered on, uh, on, on that kind of commitment. Um, so I think it's really important for other groups within the family to be able to diverge. I think it's very important for groups to be able to explore things that are particularly interesting to them. You know, embedded Debian looks different to normal Debian because it has to, because it's important. There are priorities in that environment that are different. And so, you know, there needs to be a delta. The delta only needs to be big enough to address the specific issues that that community is interested in, but there, there does need to be a delta. Uh, and if you get scared of a delta, then you're effectively going to be constraining the whole Debian world uh, in ways that I think will, will limit it. You'll be reducing its freedom effectively. Um, the flip side is that if there is going to be a delta, then we better be bloody sure we're doing it in an open source way. And so that's why we have the total commitment to only shipping open source applications, end user applications. We do include some binary drivers. Now, I think it's very important that, see, I think that's a compromise of important values in Debian. And I think it's very important that Debian has stuck absolutely to its guns uh, with regard to the DFSG and, uh, and the freedom of every piece of software that's in there. I think that's one of the things that binds this community together. But at the same time, it's useful to have within the family people who are willing to make trade-offs. For example, in embedded, embedded systems, we don't, we're not going to install doc files, right? Um, uh, everywhere else we do. Uh, and in the Ubuntu community, so we were able to make those trade-offs. I would feel very uncomfortable of, you know, with the original plan of coming into Debian and saying, you know, we should allow binary drivers because it would have been a compromise of the core values that bind this community together. So we, in as much as we've made compromises of those values, they're very clear, very explicit, and they're there for a good reason. And I can only do them in good conscience because I know that Debian maintains those core values. Um, so what are the core areas of investment? Where are we actually spending money? Uh, we hire, we employ, uh, I think, just 20 Debian developers. I think it's exactly 20. Uh, it's 19 but I'm reactivating my key. I became a Debian developer in 1995, uh, but my key is now dormant, and I've mailed the damn guys to go through the reactivation process. Um, so with me on board, that will be 20 Debian developers. I think that's about seven times as many as any other organization I'm aware of, right? That's a tremendous number of DDs that work full-time doing work on, uh, on Ubuntu, and all of those patches are available. Um, the, the, just to give you some idea of who's on that team, uh, our CTO, Matt Zimmerman, is maintainer of, of, of Apt in Debian. Uh, Matt, you guys, you guys know. Uh, Fabioni Massimo Dimito, uh, Donito, he's on the X Strike Force. He also uh, is part of the Ubuntu team. Uh, James Troop, the legendary dam. Um, uh, Pitti, maintainer of Postgres. He, uh, he is full time working for us and, f and focused on security. Uh, Doko. You guys know Doko. He is uh, maintainer of GCC and Python Bash in, uh, in, in, in Debian. He's also on the Ubuntu team. Uh, Mako, he maintains Sanity in Debian uh, and, and works on uh, the LPI board. Is that right? No, LPI, SPI. SPI. Um, uh, DAF, Keybuck, Dpackage maintainer. He works in, uh, he's on the Ubuntu team. Uh, Daniel Stone, Extract Force, Michael Vogt, Synaptic. Um, Toloff, uh, Fogheen, CF Engine. Uh, In Jackson is joining the team. He's on the uh, Debian Technical Committee. Uh, Se Se Sebastian, Sebastian Seb, Seb128, is our Gnominator. Um, uh, I think that's, that's, that's many of the guys. Um, and that's the, that's the lion's share of the investment that we're making, effectively, is in people who work full-time on, uh, on the distribution. Uh, we're also investing quite heavily in distributed revision control, BAS. 
Uh, and that's getting to the point now where I can absolutely recommend it for upstream projects, right? If, you, if you're starting off a project, then, 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 then try BAS. It's a hell of a lot cleaner and, and, and better than TLA was. And if it's you know, something experimental, then, uh, then try BASNG, uh, because BASNG is a lot easier to contribute to. It's in Python. Uh, it's a fresh uh, thing. And I really think it includes the best of BitKeeper, Docs, Monotone, and, uh, and Arch. OK, so how do we organize ourselves? Um, uh, there's the Community Council, of which I'm a member. Uh, other members on the Community Council are uh, Mako uh, and James uh, and Colin Watson. Uh, some of you guys know Colin from Groff and DI. Um, uh, we also have a technical board, and that's chaired by Matt Zimmerman, uh, the CTO. Uh, technical board is responsible for technical issues. Community uh, council is responsible for social structures and, and processes. Um, the uh, appointments to those are effectively confirmed by a vote of all, uh, all the members. Um, we also have loco teams. Uh, local community teams, which are guys spread around who kind of form uh, local advocacy groups and so on. In terms of process, uh, fundamentally we freeze unstable every six months, and then we spend a, you know, a certain amount of time um, uh, polishing and integrating the various pieces of that. Uh, what it ends up looking like uh, is something like this. If this is SID, we end up doing something like that for a few months. Uh, and then we end up doing, after our release, we end up sort of doing that. And then we come back. Um, for a few months after our release, uh, the Ubuntu release is horribly broken, right? Breezy was um, scary uh, for about four weeks uh, while we were breaking GCC, uh, modularizing X, moving X from user X11 R6 to user bin, uh, and doing all of those sorts of scary, crackful things. Um, and so we have this kind of alternating thing that, that varies around effectively what, what SID is doing. Um, we absolutely depend on, depend, uh, on Debian's continued success, right? Because this is, this is effectively the, 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 the anchor to which we have to, to, to come back. It's a hell of a lot of work to merge back when we, have to, when, when we have to merge. At this point, generally, after upstream version freeze, we're merging in. Uh, a lot of changes both ways from Debian and changes that we've made previously. Uh, what would make that work a lot easier is if Debian maintainers took more patches from, the, from, from, from Ubuntu. And so that's why we sort of go to the trouble to make those patches available in real time and in the easiest possible format. This is not, you know, throw it over the wall open source. This is not, you know, every, if we make a patch and make the upload uh, within hours or days, that patch is, is automatically published with no extra work from the maintainer. And that actually makes me think of something, uh, something that I think is really, really important. Uh, we have to try and do this stuff in an automated way because getting 20 guys to collaborate with 1,200 guys doesn't work if it requires sort of detailed personal relationships and conversations. If, if we wanted to have a five-minute conversation with every DD, it would be the whole day uh, gone just having that conversation. Um, and so something that I really hope that um, we can get a bit of an appreciation for is to the greatest extent possible, what we're trying to do is, is, is make it possible for people to collaborate with us, with us in, in as much of an automated fashion as possible. Um, it's easy to say, you know, Hal, why didn't you come and you know, explain to me why you were going to put this, you know, make this patch? Uh, but if you, if you multiply that up across 1,200 maintainers, it becomes effectively an impossible communications burden. No small organization can effectively compete with Debian for communications bandwidth, right? Debian is highly parallelized, uh, and we're not. Um, so that's why we focus so much on the automation. Uh, the next step for us is, for example, is to, to automate our relationship with the BTS so that when we fix a bug, which we know is in Debian, we will notify the Debian BTS automatically. Uh, there is some con there's some controversy around that because we have had DDs when we've gone into the BTS and said, here's a bug that we found and here's a patch for it, write back and say, fuck off. Don't disturb me with your patches. I don't consider that a bug. Uh, and that's kind of difficult to deal with because socially, right, it's a huge burden to, to, to go through that. And if you have people telling you they don't care, then it, you know, whittles down your, your willingness to continue to make that, that effort. So that's why we're going to do it 
to the greatest extent possible in an automated way, and we'll extend the existing infrastructure we have so that you as a DD can automatically effectively say, yeah, send me all the patches you've got, send me all, you know, automatically send me all the patches you've got, send me you know, information as the status changes in Ubuntu so that you can have the best possible uh, framework for doing this. Uh, if we want to realize this dream of you know, different groups that, 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 that focus really hard on particular areas, but with tight collaboration between them, we need to recognize that that collaboration will not happen in the same way that it happens within a single organization, right? It, it, it just can't work that way. Kind of one analogy is, if you consider a mountain range, right, you can be the best mountaineer in the world. There's no mountain there that you can't climb, right? But you can't be on top of all of the mountains at the same time. And I absolutely think that's true for individuals, right? The road to misery is to try and be good at too many things you know, at the same time, because you'll end up sub-optimizing across the spread. Um, and, you know, I, I happen to believe that there is absolutely no mountain that open source cannot climb. And there's no mountain, there's no goal that you could set for this organization that it couldn't achieve. If we wanted to put BDL into orbit, we could do it. <laughs> right? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it'd be a two-way ticket. <laughs> Exactly. There'd be a small crater in Arizona called B Dale. <laughs> um, so whatever goal we wanted to set for a particular organization, we could do it, right? But in doing that, we would make trade-offs elsewhere. And so, uh, so I absolutely think if we want, if we want effectively this family to extend to the point where we have people waving flags at the top of all of those peaks, we need to accept that there are going to be difference, differences between them, and that those differences cause a certain amount of social stress. Uh, so there was a very long thread on Devel about a fork or a branch, and whether Ubuntu is a fork or a branch. And there were some excellent constructive suggestions, like it's a spoon. Um, <laughs> thank, thank you for that. <laughs> uh, appreciated it. Uh, and, I, and I read that, and I, it, it, I sort of spent time trying to get to, to the bottom of this problem. And what I currently think is that the difference between those is social, right? And the key difference between those is your fundamental assumption about the nature of the character of the person who's on the other side of that. Effectively, different groupings like this carry brands, right? We know what Gentoo's brand is. And the other day, we have one of our servers called Gentoo. It's named after the penguin, not the distribution. But the other day, James told me there was a problem with our, one of our production instances of Apache, and he was just pulling a patch from Gentoo to apply to it, and I nearly um, plutzed. Um, he meant the machine, not the distribution. Um, so we know what Gentoo's brand is, right? And when you meet a Gentoo user, you have an immediate kind of uh, assumption of what they're, you know, what they're about and the approach that they would, they would take, right? Bling, crack. Um, <laughs> the, I hope there are no Gentoo users here. <laughs> I'm, what, I'm worried, what I'm worried about is the fact that, the, that, that, that representatives of the media are typing as I speak. Um, okay. Um, those sort of assumptions about what's going on in the other community are really important. So I hope that you know, what we're able to do here is, is, is give some sort of win window into what's going on in the Ubuntu community. These are Debian developers, right? I think they are superb Debian developers, right? These are guys who care very deeply about Debian. They have, in many cases, carried Debian right, over the last five, six, seven years uh, through some quite difficult times. So don't, to the extent that you have a knee-jerk reaction that is, that is negative and that that colors the kind of communication that you have, you're effectively creating the social circumstances in which you know, we could get a fork. It's a failure to communicate that creates a, a fork. It's got nothing to do with source code and everything to do with communication. Um, so a couple of questions that people have thrown at me. Hey, are we getting any questions on? OK, cool. Uh, I just want to run through some things that people have asked me that I've answered then and, I, and, I, and I'd like to sort of answer for for wider uh, consumptions. Uh, first, it, will Ubuntu be around? I heard a rumor it'll, it'll, it'll only be uh, three years. Um, when we started this, I was basically asking guys to leave good jobs to come and work with me on this crackful project. Uh, and I needed to be very clear with them the extent to which, you know, the risks that they were facing. Uh, when you ask someone to leave stable employ and come and work for, you know, effectively a startup venture with, with you know, tricky revenue prospects. Um, you need to be very clear with them. I couldn't go out there and say, you know, Ubuntu's going to be here forever, because I didn't know if it would. There was no, there's been no point if we couldn't actually achieve anything for me to continue to fund it. Uh, after one year, I extended that again for another two years, because I thought the progress in the first year justified an additional two-year commitment. 
And recently I figured this is actually uh, a really good way for me to deploy the funds that I have. So I've set up the Ubuntu Foundation and I've stuck enough cash in there and made provision for it in my will that you can bank on it that Ubuntu is going to be here for certainly a technology generation in our, in our time. So the world you know, that we're living in is that both Debian and Ubuntu are going to be here for, the, for, for our careers effectively. Um, this has become one of the ways in which I want to leave a mark on the world for, 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 for better ways. This is one of the things that I absolutely want to see there. Uh, it's one of the best things that I think I can do. Um, so the foundation essentially creates a long-term framework for that that is in independent of what happens with Canonical, independent of what happens to me to, to a certain extent. Another question is, you know, why did we start off secretly? secretly? There was uh, SSDS. I think that was an HP nickname for us, the super secret Debian startup. Um, uh, uh, that no name yet dot com was our was our um, domain for a while, uh, and the, the corporate name was un very unfortunately chosen by the bank as uh, uh, Mark Richard Shuttleworth's Virtual Development, otherwise known as Mrs. VD, um, which didn't go down well given that our first release was called the Warty Warthog. <laughs> um, yeah, um, the reason behind that is that. I hope you can appreciate that I live a somewhat unusual life. And if, I, if rumors spread about something that I'm doing, then it tends to get massively blown out of proportion in the media in, in, in South Africa. So I'm generally very careful about saying you know, that I'm interested in something, that I'm committed to something, that I'm doing something, until I actually really know that this is full steam ahead. At one stage, I thought that the stock exchange, that the stock exchange in South Africa was inefficient and that we needed a pan-African, highly liquid, automated, real-time stock exchange. You know sort of an interesting thought to wake up to in the morning. So I went to Nigeria and I met with the stock exchange guys there and I potted around and the word got into the media and the next day I had the finance minister of South Africa calling me and saying, what the hell are you, you know, can you say this is such a cool idea, what are you going to do? And I hadn't made any commitments to it at all, but whole huge chunks of people had figured that, you know, I was going to go in there and build a stock exchange. And it turned out that I wasn't going to do that. When I looked into it, it was just not something that I could particularly add any value to. So I learned from that experience, you know, don't go shooting your mouth off and don't, you know, publicize what you're doing until you're absolutely clear about it. So for the first six months while we were pulling a team together and figuring out how we were going to do this, uh, uh, we kept it confidential and we didn't have a name. Uh, once we had the name, you know, since, since from the moment we, we, we came out with the preview release and effectively said that this is a project that I was working on, uh, there's no hash of to private or uh, private mailing list. Uh, what you see is, for better or worse, what you get. Um, I've addressed the binary incompatibility issue. Um, uh, let's talk a bit about money because it is the root of all evil. Uh, so I have set up a set of structures effectively to um, hopefully in my lifetime, but if I get hit by a bus over the course of what would be a normal lifetime, deploy those funds into, into things that are, I think, important and good. Um, mostly that goes into the foundation in South Africa, but now also it will go into Ubuntu. Of course, I also enjoy my ill-gotten gains, um, and I will be going back to space. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I'm by no means a monk. The important thing about that, though, is that just off the back of normal investment processes, um, I, in a good week, make more than the entire Linux technology and service industry put together, Red Hat, Novell, Linspire, Xandros, Progeny, Canonical. This is not about trying to make money. It's very frustrating for my financial advisors that I devote three days a quarter to them uh, when they you know, effectively continue to grow the assets of the foundation uh, and everything else to Ubuntu, which will almost certainly uh, never deliver any sort of substantial return. So much of what I'm doing here is because I think this is a really important infrastructure to set up. I think over the next 20 years, we need this. Um, it's very difficult to see beyond 20 years, but over the next 20 years, we need this. Um, at the same time, if we can get this to be sustainable, then we should. I, p partly that's a challenge, and that's interesting. And partly because, remember, every dollar I spend on Ubuntu is a dollar that I don't spend on something else that I think is very important, right? Um, math is eating somebody else's lunch. So if I can get people who have money to, to, to effectively make that, uh, don't worry, Matt, it's okay, you feel good. You're skinny enough as it is, don't worry. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, if, if I can get this operation to be sustainable, I think that's a very admirable goal. I also think it's very important for the health of the whole ecosystem, right, that if you have something like Ubuntu, 
you have uh, ways that the community can interact with it, ways that nonprofits can interact with it, ways that corporates can interact with it. I don't believe that Canonical will ever make substantial amounts of money out of technology, service, and support. Its revenues for the entire future from software licensing from Ubuntu are going to be zero. Um, and professional services and support is not a great business to be in, right? It's, it's just not going to make a huge return. It's not a really an economically rational way for me to be spending my time, but I think it's important. Um, it's important in the same way that in many countries you have a reserve bank, right, which is a small private company that doesn't make much money, but which is kind of a lender of last resort. It, 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 it uh, catalyzes the industry. It's the organization that the other banks can go to effectively to, uh, to, to help set the pace of the market. So the fact that Canonical is there and will publish a price for desktop user support means that we create effectively a reference platform. And every other company, and there are hundreds of other companies that provide Ubuntu support, they use that reference platform as a way of justifying their own revenues. They say, you know, we do it, you know, that's our pricing because Canonical provides it at that. Also, it, 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 it gives smaller companies a way to compete with bigger companies because they can go effectively to the Reserve Bank and get a banking loan, which is, okay, I'm using financial and economic terms, but basically a way of saying, you know, we can provide escalation support. So I think it plays a very important role in the health of the ecosystem to have each of these pieces, pieces of the puzzle. Uh, and yeah, I like a challenge. Um, uh, uh, I like the idea that we're effectively economic, changing the economic patterns in the software industry. Uh, and I think it would be very cool, thanks, very cool to, to do that in a sustainable way. Okay, so that's the five minute alert. I've addressed most of the questions I had. Let's see, what, what do we have? Do we have anything quickly, Mako, from IRC while, while guys? Thanks to talk in a way that you could extend it a little bit. Okay, cool. Okay, will you um, link with um, the, the, the timing guys so we know where we stand? Yeah, um, who's who's got a question? Let's get a microphone up there. No problem. So, uh, who has a question? A question up there, and do we have anything from? <laughs> yeah. Question, one question was, who broke the spatial model with employees? And Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have, to, I have to take that bullet. I broke the spatial nautilus in Hori. Um, and for that, I apologize. For the GNOME people that I offended, I apologize there. Let me give you some background to, to that. Uh, at early on in the process, um, I had problems with spatial, and so I asked us to try something different. And for communication failures internally, that patch got dropped. And then right before release, I was going through my list of things that I'd, that I'd asked for. That wasn't in, and so I asked the decision for the patch to be applied. Knowing that it would be rough, knowing that it would, that it would be uh, tricky, but just said, you know, this is my call, let's go in. Now, to put that into perspective, I make maybe 50 different calls around packaging, uh, organization, docs, code, bits and pieces that are kind of things that I really want to see in. And this is one of those. Uh, there have been lots of other ones that ended up working really well, decisions that we made around how we organize the desktop and so on. And this one sucked ass. I'm, you know, I'm sorry about it. Um, but that is part of what we can do in Ubuntu, right? We can take risks. Uh, those risks don't cost you anything. Uh, and I think it's fairly clear that uh, Debian has learned not to put in um, uh, the kind of spatial, not to modify spatial in the way that we did. I think that's a valuable contribution to, if nothing else, uh, <laughs> science. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a negative result. So that was entirely my, my fault. Please don't um, um, flame Seb or Jeff about that. That was my call. And they protested vigorously, and, uh, and I asked for it to go ahead anyway. Let's take Jeff's question. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, so I was wondering, um, uh, with the Ubuntu patches and the changes that you make to um, Debian packages, um, in cases where Debian maintainers disagree with the work that you've done, do you have any kind of process, or could you go into the process that you use to resolve those conflicts so that the, you don't turn into a fork or yeah. that you don't have a dispute there? So, so any delta is, is a cost. Any delta is a cost to me, and it's a, it's a, it's a risk. And you know, as soon as we have an indication that there's going to be a delta, there's always going to be a delta anytime we do something new. But if we have an indication that there's a delta that might be a sustained delta, then I you know, have to really review it. Um, and in some cases, you know, those have happened. And we've said we, you know, we're, we're, we're going to go ahead. Um, uh, some cases we've said we're not going to go ahead. Um, in each case, we simply have to review it and sort of figure out you know, what, what, as a group, we're going to do and whether or not we or I am willing to carry the cost of that delta. Uh, in most cases, in most cases, 
um, when you actually have an extended conversation, uh, uh, the, the delta gets closed. But not in all cases. And I'm absolutely willing to carry a delta, right? If it's something that's important, for, you know, if it's something that's important for us to stay on this peak over here, right? He's not going to carry the delta. He's not going to carry the delta. And Debian may well not carry the delta, right? But it's important for us to address a particular need, so we're going to do that. Ian. Yeah. Oh, we've got a, we've got a question at the mic. Okay, let's just take another question over here, and then maybe in, you can chip in after that. Yeah, this related as well. Um, during the thread that you referred to earlier about fork, uh, the Ubuntu fork, um, there was one post that there were uh, bugs in Debian that had not been picked up by the maintainers from Ubuntu. And one of those bugs I looked into, and I saw that uh, the patch that was submitted assumed that UDEV was available. And UDEV isn't available in uh, Debian yet because it's not across all platforms. We don't have the kernels yet. Uh, so is it possible to distinguish between patches that Debian is ready for and things that should, be, should probably go into Debian but not yet? Yeah, that would be quite difficult to do on an automated basis because we could probably test if the patch will apply cleanly, but um, testing you know, patches that infer policy machines would, would kind of require us developing a Turing machine. Uh, Matt, Breezy? <laughs> um, and and <laughs> that, 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 that would be tricky. Um, what, we could, you know, what we should probably do is, is, or what I hope we'll do, is extend the... Extend the the infrastructure around the patches so that the, to the point where there can actually be a conversation and maybe where you can mark up and say, patch, I don't want to look at it again. Uh, again, you know, part of the thing with distributed revision control is you don't assume that every patch is going to necessarily apply cleanly or be the right thing. You know, when you do emerge, there's some responsibility to say, what am I merging and, and, and is it going to work? In general, I think the process will work. Was it, was it a big problem for you? Did you apply the patch and then have it fail spectacularly? Or? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, look, that is, that is going to happen. Uh, for example, architectures, you know, we have, a, we have a different architecture set, so a patch may not work, uh, you know, it may fail to build from source on some of the Debian architectures. But I think that's part of the healthy process, right? There are better guys in this community to address that issue than in, in, in the Ubuntu community. Uh, to the extent, if you have ideas as to how we can avoid that, we, we certainly can do, especially if we can automate it. Um, but, I, you know, I can't guarantee that every patch will apply cleanly in, in, in both cases. Um, Ian, you wanted to just clarify further. Yeah, um, so there's, there's been a lot of sort of, you know, is, is Ubuntu a fork? And this seems like the same question as is Debian a fork of all the upstreams? And what Ubuntu is doing to Debian's packages is pretty much exactly the same thing as Debian has been doing to its upstreams for years. And each time we make a decision about, you know, we'll apply some patch and we send it upstream, and if the upstream hates us, then we say, well, you know, I mean, we want this patch, and that's our decision. And I don't think there's anything that Ubuntu are doing that's wrong. And I don't, obviously, Ubuntu could choose. They could choose to actually fork it and make it so that the two versions weren't compatible. But that's, you know, as Mark's saying, that's just so expensive and such hassle. We in Debian don't want to do that for our packages and make them, you know, so that we can't apply the new version from upstream either. Um, and it's, the situation seems entirely parallel. Okay, cool. Um, so, one of the cool things, I think, is that every single guy here is effectively an Ubuntu developer, right? If you, if you write a, p a line of code, there's a 99.999% chance that that code is going gonna, is gonna to land up in an Ubuntu release uh, with semi-naked people on it. Um, the, the, just kidding. The, um, the, 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 the flow, I hope, will continue to be that good, effectively, that that anything that, that, that you guys work on will also reach that community, right? And I know that the majority of guys in the free software community care about shipping high-quality stuff to the greatest possible audience. And so I hope that we're providing, in one sense, a really valuable service, effectively, taking this phenomenal code, taking it into places where it otherwise wouldn't have got or wouldn't have got yet. Uh, and so in some ways, I hope that that's, that's a kind of a critical service that we provide. Debian provides critical services of its own. It is, in many ways, the, the conscience of the open source community, right? It's the one community that has remained absolutely true to the fundamental principles of free software. 
Um, and in partnership, I think that's that's a tremendously powerful thing. Brendan. It's not a follow-on question. It's one from scratch. So I mean, okay. Um, I was wondering because it's difficult for me to accept as an article of faith because I'm a pretty skeptical guy um, that that you know Ubuntu is necessarily a good thing for the Debian project in all possible respects. I have to wonder how would we measure that if if Ubuntu were somehow harmful to Debian? How would we know that? How would we measure it? And how would you react to it if you saw those same measurements? Uh, so I'd certainly, you know, I'd, I'd welcome that. Um, and I don't expect you to take it as an, as an article of faith, right? You know, I could be wrong. Um, uh, we could be wrong. Um, there, you know, I, I don't expect this group in particular to take anything uh, as an article of, of faith. I think in this case, constructive paranoia is, you know, part of the engine of the success of, uh, of Debian. Paranoia is a, is a healthy thing. Uh, I'm a pretty damn skeptical guy myself. Um, I hope that over time we'll have an open line of communication. We've had some very good con conversations, and you know it's important to me that, that my relationship with the DPL always be clear, and, and not just with a, a person in a role capacity, but with an individual developers. Um, I hope that Joey had a great expression for this debate. He said, we should try to bring more light and less heat. Uh, and I think that's an excellent way to, to phrase it, right? Uh, I hope that we can continue to, to have a good conversation. Uh, my phone number. Brendan, did I actually answer your question? Well, I was wondering if you had any specific ideas for measurements. I realize that's a tall order, but you probably have been thinking about it for a while. Uh, could you repeat Brandon's question? Uh, Brandon's question? Brandon's question was, how do we know, how do we measure that Ubuntu is actually a, a good thing for Debian and for, for the free software community? Uh, it's really important to me that we get this right, right? You know, I, I do not want to go screwing up what I see as the big, fundamental, wonderful thing that's happening in technology. Uh, absolutely want to get it right. So if you have any clear indicators that we can use, then call me. Do you have a question over here? Fire away. Okay, thanks. Uh, about startups, software startups and Linux in, in general, I'd, uh, you said something, uh, something like uh, lots of innovations come from, from small software com companies. Now I uh, see a problem here that, uh, that uh, uh, they try to protect themselves from big companies and other competition by patenting and so on. Now imagine there is a software company with really good usability uh, innovation. Uh, what would you say to uh, the company head? Uh, uh, why go open source? Because there are so, uh, what, what is there to gain? Uh, because there is so much to lose, you know. Uh, they have put maybe one million dollar to <laughs> make make this thing. And there are so many arguments for a new software company today. Still, uh, can you use the ones behind the yeah, podium? Okay. Just yeah. There, there are there are so many reasons for a, a new software company today to to go open source. Uh, you know, there there you you can argue that there are moral and ethical reasons, but I, the the one that's a killer. Uh, to a business guy is, is simply this. This is not, not about right and wrong. It's about winning and losing. And you are going to lose if you are not an open source platform because you're going to be competing with people who are building on an open source platform. And if they're building on an open source platform, they're almost certainly going to be using an open source platform. And they have the community behind them. I absolutely think that, you know, that the prospect starting a, starting a proprietary software business in 10 years' time is going to look and feel about the same as starting a wooden horse-drawn carriage company uh, you know, did at about 1950. Clearly a very, very bad idea and sort of missing the point of where the industry has gone. Uh, at the moment, that's still, you know, there's still a lot of guys out there who don't see that. But, uh, you know, it, in my mind, it's, it's absolutely clear. And I, I make that argument any time I meet somebody who's in the business one way or the other. The, 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 the really hard position to be in is to have a, a big vested interest in one way of doing it. The guys who are really going to struggle are uh, uh, we'll beat up a Microsoft, but it goes deeper than Microsoft. It's anybody who's, whose size of company is currently des determined by the revenues they can generate through software licensing because those revenues are going to come back by a factor of 10 uh, at least, and they're going to have to restructure and re-engineer and, and reinvent themselves. 
Uh, and while they're sort of beating this steady retreat, young companies are going to come up starting from fresh with the right attitude, the right values, the right approach. They're going to be very vulnerable in the interim. So it's, it's actually very difficult, I think, for existing entrenched companies to, 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 to get to where they need to be. Uh, it's easier if you're starting out to get it right from the beginning. Yeah, Andres. Okay. Uh, thank you for, at first for, for making Debian popular in the world, and I think the success of... Oh, Debian Ubuntu was very popular before I came yeah, along. But <laughs> as you did it more, people uh, learned to know it. And I think the success uh, always creates rumor, and, uh, and so I hope to be can a little bit calm down, and I hope that the cutlery of spoon and forks, there is no ni uh, knife in between. And my question is... Um, how is uh, um, this, this kind of universe related to this graph? My, uh, I'm a little bit afraid that the, the um, Ubuntu universe is some kind of sit in parallel, and there is a potential to, to split up, and why um, are these volunteer Ubuntu people not... So, uh, there, there, there is a risk. Um, it's the same risk that the Linux kernel will fork. Um, there... there you know, th that's something that people argued, that's something that, you know, Sun and others waved around as a big stick. Oh, you can't trust Linux because it's going to fork. You can't trust the GPL. You can't trust open source because it's, it's going to fork. Uh, but in fact, there is absolutely no indication that the Linux kernel is ever going to fork. Uh, it may well branch for good reason, right? You see Linux, user Linux, sorry, uh, user mode Linux. <laughs> um, uh, th those are effectively sort of sustained long-term branches. Uh, but we're not going to see a, a, a fork in the Linux kernel unless there's a real social problem in the way that, you know, Zorg and X386 forked because there was a social problem. Um, and so that's why I say this, there's no code or technical or, frankly, business pressure to fork. Um, it, Red Hat has effectively been found out, I think, that it's very expensive to... Uh, to maintain a fork of the upstream world. I mean, Debian, all distros are, in a sense, a fork of the whole of upstream, as, as, as Ian pointed out. But Red Hat took this to an extreme. And, you know, I would never have joined this industry if I thought that that was a natural endpoint. Because, frankly, you know, remember, every dollar I spend on this comes out of, you know, other projects, education and, and health and so on, that I think are really, really important in places that I really care about. I don't want to carry 500 developers uh, maintaining, you know, vast numbers of patches. That, that's pointless. Um, yeah, let's, let's get the microphone um, over here. This is my question before it comes over. Um, I asked that question the other day already at the round table for the driver. Um, why is Ubuntu called Linux for humans and not Debian for humans? Um, Linux, Linux simply carries a lot of, a lot of trademarks. If you, if you, you know, if... Oh, sorry. The question is why is Ubuntu, why is the tagline Linux for human beings and not uh, a, a Debian for human beings? Um, first... Within, within Ubuntu, if you go, you know, panel about Ubuntu, you, you'll read about Debian. Uh, I, I haven't yet met somebody who uses Ubuntu who doesn't know that it's based on Debian. Um, we, we don't call it Debian, right? There, there's reasons, you know, why I chose the name Ubuntu. It's important to me. It's a particularly special word in South Africa, and I think it speaks beautifully about what free software is, is all about. Um, there are some folks who will never be satisfied, right, with the, the, the way those two brands uh, in, interact. But I think we do a reasonable job. If you actually fire up, if you actually fire up Ubuntu and you know look at its own documentation, you will you will immediately um, see that. Uh, Linux, in terms of the specific question of why Linux for human beings and not Debian for human beings, and and uh, you know absolutely, we're simply carrying on the the excitement that the world has about Linux and sort of saying this is a Linux that, you know, everybody can use. Jeff. Uh, okay, do we have a microphone there? Go ahead, and then Jeff will come to you. All right. Uh, my question is actually kind of related that, to that, and I think I would have something that might be a simple solution to it in that you continue calling it Linux for human beings, but whenever you give handout trainings to your commercial customers, or when we get around developing something that might be an Ubuntu certification system in place, then we market Ubuntu Linux and we deliver an Ubuntu Debian training. Ubuntu Debian GNU Linux. Yeah, <laughs> right. Okay. And by the I, time you add the BSD license to it, right, it becomes impossibly long. But my point being that to, to keep that le leveraging that popularity of the word Linux, we, 
would be simple enough to keep on doing it that way, but when you do deliver something, then you take the opportunity to point yeah. out. I think. I mean, I think you identified some sort of key communications points that we need to make sure we, we preserve that message, and uh, I'll work with you to, to do that. Make okay, uh, sorry, uh, before we continue, uh, well, first of all, it's have to be Ubuntu, Debian, GNU, Linux. Uh, secondly, and more importantly, uh, we're uh, extending into the launch period now. If people want to stay and continue asking questions, that's fine. But be aware, you may run out of time to eat lunch. So it's up to you. I want to take Peter's question, because he always asks good ones. Okay. And, uh, uh, and sorry, Jeff. also, there has been a person waiting here quite patiently for a while. So I think OK, Jeff, do you mind if we take some from here? Right here. OK. OK. Well, do him first. Yeah, Mako, go ahead. Um, so from the from the uh, from the SPI trademark committee, I'm not entirely sure that that we can say this is based on Debian. You can use Debian descriptively, but but as long as something is using Linux, the trademark you, they can say this is Linux. I'm not sure that that it would be that our trademark policy, you know, or our ability to keep a Debian trademark would allow us to allow people to call non Debian distributions Debian. I'm not sure it could be legally Is that DFSG possibly. compatible? Well, DF, well, that's, that's, a, that's a conversation for another, uh, for another talk. Okay, okay. So. Let's, let's, let's get the patient question and then Peter's question and then Jeff's question. Okay, there we go. Switch it on. Come, come down here, Peter, Peter, or just shout and I'll repeat it. Just, just ask me and I'll repeat the question. And the back room and they can crank up the gain. Two kinds of questions. Uh, if you care about the beginner's desktops, are you looking to the uh, biggest um, uh, missing features on the Linux side at the moment, which is Java and Flash? And the other thing, uh, do you have an opinion on software patents? And are you doing anything to uh, push your message to the right people? Okay, so um, the questions were, we care about desktop Linux, are we doing anything about Java and Flash, which Peter describes as the sort of key stumbling blocks. Uh, I agree, I think those are, those are two of the critical things we need to get before people have a seamless uh, desktop experience. There will always be those critical stumbling blocks, and there's some that we feel more keenly than others. And remember, there'll always be pe some people who just want to retire before Linux actually happens in their company, and they will, you know, they'll say, you know, I bought this PDA yesterday, and it doesn't sync, so this entire company can't move. To, uh, to free software. Uh, I don't actually see critical blockers in the same way that other people see critical blockers. To me, it's all about percentages. Uh, in any large organization, there's a percentage that can switch right now. They don't need Java, they don't need Flash. So I, I don't see any blockers to the process of starting the deployment of, of Linux. Uh, in terms of Java and, and Flash, I don't invest in, in either of those. Um, Doco and others have banged on um, uh, the use of GCJ, particularly in the, in the, in, in the open office context, but that doesn't really um, solve the problem. Uh, I know that there is some interesting work now on a, a sort of free reference implementation of Java, uh, and I'm pretty certain that this problem is going to go away. But we, uh, uh, you know, I'll be honest, we don't invest very heavily in upstream development except in the areas that I described, like distributed revision control, bug tracking, and so on. Uh, and your second question was? Software patents. Software patents are evil. Uh, before, 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 before you clap, pa patents themselves are not evil. Patents are the original open source. And, and here's how. Pa patents are effectively a viral GP GPL-style mechanism to get people who've learned something interesting to disclose it. So in the old days, if you learned something interesting, like how to make you know, um, uh, asparagus soft, uh, you would keep that in the family for generations, and the rest of the world wouldn't know that secret. That was a trade secret, and companies you know, in those days would say, trade secret, that's how they advertised that they had something cool. And nowadays people say, patented you know, formula, yada, 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 that's how they advertise that they've got something cool. But effectively what a patent is, is a trade with an inventor for disclosure, like open source is about disclosure, in return for a short-term monopoly, and that's reasonable. Uh, the problem with software patents and business process patents is that there's no trade. We give these guys a monopoly, right, for something which they could not keep a secret. You can't keep a software process a secret. You can't keep an algorithm a secret, and you can't keep one click or a, or a business process a secret, right? The moment you do it, everyone says, cool idea, we'll do it too. So 
in terms of the, the, the benefit to society argument, right, software and business process patents are a complete ripoff. They're society giving away its rights to an idea in exchange, you know, for an idea that they would have had anyway the moment the guy, uh, that they would have learned anyway the moment the guy started to do it. So that's, that's an argument. And, you know, I, I know people sometimes don't like it when I say, you know, patents as a whole are not, are, are not evil, but software patents and business process, pr process patents are, are. That they think that that's equivocating. But this argument is one that really catches legislators because it's a way of giving them a bullshit test uh, against the lobbyists. When the lobbyists come and say, you know, uh, this is something that you need to do, they can ask them the question, what is the economic trade that society is making when you do that? It's the same with copyright extension, right? The, law, the RIAA goes in and says, you know, you must extend copyrights or the Beatles will become worthless, right? And we need the continued uh, royalties from the Beatles music so that we can find new stars and support the music industry. And actually what we need to be saying is, hold on a sec, when copyrights expire, they, they don't become owned by nobody. They become owned by everybody. And you need to make an economic argument because that's what legislators are, are looking at. They're looking at the benefits to society. But cool, thanks for the question. Jeff. Uh, yeah, I decided to move down here so the microphone would move quicker. Um, if I could indulge a little bit of paranoia um, for a second. Um, looking at the uh, roster of Ubuntu employees and looking at the roster of very core people in Debian, you find a great intersection. Uh, there's several people who um, might become nervous about this and who, wa who might wonder, for example, if uh, Ubuntu is going to become the horse that drags Debian the cart behind it. Uh, simply, hello. Simply by virtue of the fact that the uh, um, that Ubuntu is paying all of these people and thus has a lot of influence over the direction that Ubuntu takes, and also then as the direction that Debian takes. I was wondering if you have any uh, response to that, or if perhaps you've set up any kind of procedures to ensure the independence of things and and so I, on. I certainly do. I have one absolute rule, which which everybody knows, and that is that. Uh, specifically to ensure independence, I will never employ the DPL. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> The well, every every every, deep, every DPL, you know, it's a rotating job. So, <laughs> so so Brandon, there'll come a time. That's a that's a, that's a tricky that's a tricky thing that we haven't yet had to deal with. But I, you know, I it's a, it's a conversation that I generally have with anyone who you know clearly has you know made the sort of commitment that would put them in line for that position. And it's, it's a tough one, but I think, you know, I think it's really, really important. And, you know, I, I absolutely, this is no question of the independence of Brandon. I think he's doing an excellent job, and I've enjoyed the conversations that we've had. Thank you. Uh, but can you imagine the constructive paranoia if Canonical employed the DPL? Uh, I would feel uncomfortable with that. And so, you know, I, that, that's why from the very beginning, it's been sort of one of, one of, uh, one of the key things. Positions that I would not want to employ folks in, and, and it's sort of worked out that we do, in some cases, sort of unexpectedly for me. Uh, but I kind of just deal with that, and, and, and we go on. I think the independence of Debian, th there are a couple of things that are absolutely critical values for Debian. The first is the, the DFSG and the, and the critical focus, the the single-minded focus on that. B. Dale pointed it out in, in a meeting the other night. Um, the second is its independence. Uh, and so it would be a real problem for me if Canonical employed the DPL. Uh, it's not so much a problem for me if somebody else employs the DPL because that's between them and, and you know, uh, but it would be a problem for me. Um, uh, ports are a critical thing. There was a rumor that somehow the Vancouver proposal was my idea, and you couldn't be more wrong, right? I, I think one of the critical things that this group does is sustain uh, architecture independence in ways that are interested. We are seeing Nokia doing really interesting things. Where's, where's data? We're seeing Nokia doing really interesting things with Debian because of the ports infrastructure, um, and that's really, really important. And that's gonna get more important because this world is getting more complex architecturally, not less. Um, uh, so they, these are sort of key values that I would never want uh, at, at Debian to, to compromise on. Any other questions? Anything else from IRC? Uh, I have one. Go ahead. Here. Uh, who do you think has the responsibility of uh, submitting patches to, to the really upstream? I mean, that you make the patches... So if, if I can get a Debian. patch upstream, that's prize number one, because then it goes to Gentoo, it goes to Red Hat, it goes to Debian, it goes everywhere. I think we should all remember that open source is about upstream. 
And if we can get something into the kernel upstream, that's the first prize. If we can get something into X upstream, that's the first prize. It helps all of us, right? One okay. less patch that everybody has to maintain. So you are also working about with the... Yeah, uh, ab absolutely. I mean, for example, I work on, on XORG, right? Uh, our XORG maintainer is also part of the XORG upstream team. So that has really helped our ability to do that. And to the extent we can get work in upstream, for example, supporting multi-seat, uh, multi ass as we call it, um, the 441 style configuration, um, where you've got multiple windowing terminals. You know, we did a chunk of work of that, that, that that's gone upstream. We, you know, to the extent that we can get stuff upstream, absolutely, that's a, that's a win for everybody in the, in the open source world. Uh, uh, upstream, downstream, midstream is not as simple as you know, a clean picture would suggest, right? You, you take the most efficient route possible. I think we're kind of cutting too far into people's lunch time. So I'm going to stay here. I'm also, we can also, I'm, um, uh, Martin Craft asked me to get together over a beer and I asked him to invite anybody else has more questions. So it's six, Martin, can I do this? Okay, I'm going to do it anyway. Um, so it's 6 p.m. sort of over at the hotel at the covered sort of drinking area, drinking pavilion there. Um, well, over a beer, continue questions and answers. And I'll stay here now um, uh, if anyone has particular questions they want to come. So thank you very much. Thank you, guys.